All right. Let's get this out of the way first. The thoughts, views, and opinions expressed on Tailboard Talks Firefighter Podcast are solely those of the speakers, guests, and host, and do not in any way represent the thoughts or views or opinions of any other employer, partnership, or sponsor. The material and information in this podcast is for general information purposes only and should be used at the listener's discretion. Here comes the intro. Skip forward 30 seconds if you want to get right to the episode. This is the Tailboard Talk Podcast, the best health, wellness, and lifestyle resource for the fire service. We're using stories, lessons, and tips from the front lines to give a realistic view of what the job can do to us and how we can make it out alive. I'm Chris Morella, a firefighter since 03, medic since 05, full-time since 08, and promoted to lieutenant in 20. I'm also a personal trainer and strength coach, and I'm here to give you the best information and host the best discussions to make us capable and durable, both on the job and away from it. So grab a heater, steal some fancy creamer from First Shift, and let's go chat. Um, <laughs> let's start with this. How did you how did you get hooked up with the conferences, the first responder conferences? Because we're both speaking at it in May, um, and you're a retired cop, and I'm an active firefighter. So it kind of brings a lot of public service together, which I think is pretty cool. But how did you get hooked up with them? The way I got hooked up, I um, I uh, teach yoga. And I have a practice that's called Yoga Five O, and um, I was trying to get into this police department near me, Elkhart Police Department. So I ran into the police chief, and I had sent him a letter months ago about offering teaching yoga to his officers, and I never got a response back, but that's okay. I sent a bunch of letters to a bunch of police chiefs and didn't get a response back, so so he apologized for it. No big deal. So I would, he, he said he was interested, so he told me he had just hired this social worker to work with their department that was doing things with the department. Hmm. So I got into contact with her. We met, and I told her my story and then I told her a little bit about the yoga and she says oh wow she said that um she had just partnered up with the first responders conferences Hmm. to co-host a conference in South Bend and she said wow that a lot of this seems similar to what you're talking about so then a couple of days later, she emailed me and said, hey, would you be interested in speaking at this conference? And I said, sure. So she gave me an application or a link to the application. And I did. And then I, I met with Sean, the founder of First Responders Conferences, and, and she interviewed me and we talked and I told her my, my backstory. And, and um, here I am getting ready to speak in uh, May. That's awesome. So, so will May be the first time that you formally kind of put together and compiled your story for like a presentation or do you do, you do that through your practice and, and uh, your studio and, and all that? Well, um, well, I don't have a studio, but um, I, I, I go to where I need to go, but um, I started out. Okay. So if, if you want to get right into my backstory, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think kind of talk about that so i i had a heart attack um uh, i wouldn't say in the mid I, I guess you could say in the middle of my career um i had a heart attack and after my heart attack I, I went through a lot of different lifestyle changes and um I'll, I'll get back to some of those in a, in a minute but um during this time i'm going through all these changes um with with getting into exercise and 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 paying attention to my nutrition and getting into stress management with yoga and meditation and understanding the importance of um, love and support and connections how important that is and sleep with all of that i'm doing this lifestyle change some lady i knew connected me to this um lady doing a documentary out of Indianapolis. This lady was doing a documentary on um, lifestyle medicine. And so she got into contact with me and she interviewed me. We talked a little bit and she decided to put me in the, uh, um, in the documentary. So she came up here several times and, and she had a cameraman, they took footage, she interviewed me and she ended up, 
um, uh, get me in this documentary. Well, she's also a part of this group called the Indiana Lifestyle Medicine Network. She's one of the founding members. So she told me about how they have these meetings online and then they have these quarterly meetings in Indianapolis where they'll, um, they get these doctors together talking about lifestyle medicine and the public's welcome. And, um, she told me that they were going to show that documentary down there. And she wants to know if I wanted to go down there and, and be on a panel and talk about it. So I did that. And um, so I got to talk about my story there and I've been going ever since. Huh. And um, they'll show different documentaries um, uh, every quarter. And uh, so I'm not on a panel every time I'm in the audience now, but um, it's very interesting stuff. So then I also got hooked up with a lifestyle medicine um, nurse practitioner out of Florida. She has a podcast she heard about my story, liked my story. She interviewed me. I talked about lifestyle medicine and my story about being a police officer who suffered a heart attack and um, turned to lifestyle medicine. And uh, actually, I, I, I believe arguably that I'm in the best physical and mental shape of my life. And I'm in my 50s now. So lifestyle medicine is just it's incredible how um just making some pointed changes in your life could, can make all the difference in the world. Okay. So let's, let's um, go back just for one second because I like documentaries. It's kind of, aside from just junk, terrible TV, it's like number, well, so I guess it's number two on the list besides that, because there's not much else going on, but um, what's the documentary name and where can people find that? Um, Optimizing life. That's the name of the documentary. Um, I think if you put it in a Google search, you'll find it on, uh, you'll, you'll find it on YouTube. Okay. Um, it's, 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 uh, the, the news channel that, uh, the, the director worked or the producer worked for is WFYI in Indianapolis, but okay. it, it's called optimizing life. Okay. And then, so let's define, um, lifestyle medicine. Cause I gotta be honest, I, I hadn't heard of that term before when it comes to just addressing these core pillars of kind of lifestyle and um, your social habits and the way you eat and, and drink and exercise and move and, and have relationships. I've never heard them categorized as lifestyle medicine. If you said lifestyle medicine to me, I would think it's a chiropractor scheme. Uh, that's just the first thing that comes to my head is like, oh, somebody's selling something, you know, not necessarily just a, a grouping of things that you should pay attention to. So go into just a little bit or just define lifestyle medicine and kind of the core pillars of what, what this thing is. Well, 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 my definition, I don't know what the official, um, uh, definition is, but, but to me, it's the, um, it's lifestyle interventions, um, that, uh, address behaviors that you can do in your life, um, as opposed to just taking, um, traditional prescriptions so um the lifestyle medicine i there's a um a group called i think the american college of lifestyle medicine and i think they have um exercise stress management nutrition i think uh um love and support or connections sleep and um, avoiding toxic uh, um, substances like alcohol and tobacco. Okay. Those, so those are the six pillars. Now, I, I, when I went through my changes through cardiac rehab, it, they didn't call it lifestyle medicine. It was this doctor called Dr. Dean Ornish, probably 40 some odd years ago, maybe in the 70s or 80s. He's a cardiologist he did some studies that he found by making some lifestyle changes, you can prevent, slow down, stop, and possibly reverse heart disease. Right. And, so and, are they just looking at tax kind of the modifiable, modifiable risk factors then? It's just a, a nice formal and um, doctor-endorsed 
package to do that with? Well, what what he did was he he went and and he his interventions were exercise, nutrition, stress management, and then love and support. Okay, those are four pillars, and and he had a control group and the experimental group, and he had some outcomes to where he showed he he that they did reverse nice. heart disease. So when I had the opportunity to get into this program. I, I jumped at it because when I heard the words reverse, because when I had my heart attack, I found out I do have heart disease. Mm. So when I heard the possibility of stopping, slowing down, reversing, I jumped on it. And with with this Ornish program, it was twice a week, four hours a day. So eight hours a week for nine weeks. So 72 total hours. So during that four hour um, section, that, that four hour uh, a day, we did exercise. So we did an hour of exercise in the morning. So we had an exercise physiologist um, talk to us about exercise. And then the next hour was um, uh, the stress management. So it was yoga and meditation. And we learned about how, how that, that helps. And then we, did the uh, love and support group support we had a therapist there and you know we got to talk about things and they told us the importance of human connection and having somebody to talk to and and then the last one was nutrition so we did an hour of going over nutrition and cooking and and so this program I'm sure you could understand the exercise part, you know, doing some exercise, stress management was yoga and meditation group support is telling us, you know, have good, healthy, strong relationships. But the nutrition part was, um, plant-based. Okay. No meat, no, no dairy. So for the past seven years, that's how I eat. It's, it's whole food plant-based. Okay. So the obvious question here, and this is just, uh, I think maybe the natural skeptic side of me. So don't I don't mean to uh, come off as abrasive or or insulting at all. Are they is this a program? Like are they selling this, or do you have to pay to go into the program, or are they selling? Do they have like proprietary supplements and no? Uh, like no, where's where, no. so I just want to get kind of get that baseline not necessarily out of the way, but established because I know if I was listening to this, I'd be like, okay, where's the sales pitch coming? Like, I, do I have to buy a, a a shake, you know, once a day and eat that and I'm no. going to be calorie restricted and all this stuff. No, no, no supplements. None of that. Um, so the cardiac rehab was at the hospital. Um, my insurance covered it because, because anybody, I, I think throughout the country, if you suffer a heart attack and you go to the hospital for an intervention, they're going to offer you cardiac rehab, right? Go through rehab. This was just, uh, it was called intense cardiac rehab but it's based on the Ornish reversal program. And so insurance, they just recently, a few years ago, insurance covers it. Meta, I think Medicare covers it. And they kind of opened it up to where it's not just heart disease, it's diabetes and maybe a couple other diseases. But I, I, it, it was through my insurance and I never, there was never any offer of, it's, it's eating whole food, so they right. never even talk to us really about, you know, he doesn't advertise any supplements in the program. The hospital didn't advertise any supplements. Um, I've spoken to several groups at even a different hospital that, that does it, and um, it's still the same way. They don't – it's not a program like some diet program or, you know – get healthy quick with this. It's, it's, it's none of that. It's an, it's an intervention. And, um, so yeah, I've never had to pay for anything or. Yeah. I mean, that. I mean, that's great because there's a few, there's a few buzzwords in the, you know, the fitness, wellness, lifestyle scene that as soon as you hear them, you're like, Oh, this is selling something like, okay. Um, you know, if you hear a program named after someone or something that's they, oh, oh, they've yeah. turned something into their thing. You're like, oh, great. This is going to be some somebody trying to sell, to sell something. As soon as you hear like holistic lifestyle, um, alternative treatment, any of those things that seem to try to compete with modern medicine, what, rightfully or not, it's, it, it's always like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, you're waiting for like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, this is awesome. Where's the catch? Like, where do I start paying 
that I have to get the full benefit from this thing. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that it is truly just an alternative pathway you can take that just focuses on those modifiable factors and, and really starts to teach people uh, who need the most, obviously, in cardiac rehab after significant cardiac events, how to start living a, a more healthy lifestyle through fundamental principles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm a skeptic too, so I, I, I completely understand you asking that question. But um, even my cardiologist now, he's not tied to the cardiac rehab or anything, and he just loves. He 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 knows because he's a cardiologist. He's been to train training, so he's heard of this. Sure. Um, I think I know more about it than he does. <laughs> um, but it's not saying that to brag. It's just that he's just. He's a cardiologist, and that lifestyle medicine is sort of a part that's not not very close to his. Like I'm one of his only patients that that does this to this degree. Right, right. And um, so he he we have great conversations anytime I go in there because he just loves to to see what I'm doing. And that I'm continuing with this because it's a lifestyle. Sure. It's um, that's all it is. It's not I don't buy any certain supplements or anything. It's a, it's a lifestyle. That's great. So, yeah, there's definitely a point, um, unfortunately, with the healthcare system where it's like there's that fine line between being the Google scholar and competing with doctors. But also there's a point where you can be a, a huge asset to doctors because, I mean, they got t- dozens and dozens of patients a day. Right. And it's not that they don't care. Like, that's not it. It's that they, they definitely care, but their bandwidth is only so much. And, and unfortunately, with the system we have in place, it's like, yeah, if you're, not, if you're not intensely and intimately aware of what your issue is or what your treatment plan is, then things are going to get missed because you need to be an advocate as much as they need to be a professional. And um, so there's definitely a fine line, but I'm glad to hear you have the relationship because, you know, we hear about the Google scholars all the time that go and tell a doctor what's wrong with them and uh, just errantly, but being an asset uh, is only going to help your doctor. His job is easier because he knows you got it covered and you're going to be compliant enthusiastically with what he's telling, what he knows the best practices. Then it helps you that if something happens, um, not only have you built that trust between you two, but you can recognize it sooner and bring that to his attention and he's going to pay attention to it. So it's, it's really just a benefit for all. The more educated we are as, as patients and consumers uh, without becoming, um, you know, a, a Google document or a Google diploma hanging on our wall. So, um, well, that's great. So what, so how, how drastic did your lifestyle change then pre and post heart attack? Wow. That, that's a great question. And, 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 uh, so it, I had my heart attack at, at, uh, at, at the age of 46. So I was actively a police officer and I, um, I ate pretty much whatever I wanted. And I grilled a lot outside. And in the Midwest, as you know, um, we have, you know, our, our winters. Right. <laughs> and I still grilled outside. Okay. And um, so eating all this grilled meat all the time and drinking, I, I wouldn't grill unless I was drinking. So our, I had to drink while I was grilling. I right. just think of <laughs> So, so I drank, I grilled, I knew exercise was just important in life. You know, I was a high school athlete, but you know, and I was in relatively decent shape to be a police officer, but I, I, I was more off and on. I was off and on in in my exercise more off than on. There was always an excuse not to work out or you miss a workout because of work or family. Um, And so I was more often on an exercise and then my relationships, I was always, um, uh, I don't want to make my problem somebody else's problem. Mm. So I talked about any issues I might've had. And plus being a police officer, I was skeptical of other, pe- other people. I thought everybody had an angle. Everybody lied. Um, I certainly would never have gone to a professional like therapist to talk to because for one, they wouldn't understand. Two, they're they're I, I just didn't trust them. Sure. So um and I didn't really get good sleep um because working part time jobs, working overtime. I was on call out of my 
27 years in law enforcement. I was on call probably 24 of those years. And so um, I was not aware of how all those areas were affecting me. So when I had my heart attack and I go through cardiac rehab and 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 I'm learning all these um, pillars of good health, um, uh, I have three daughters too. So when I woke up, out of my intervention in the hospital of having, you know, the, the angioplasty and them going into my heart. I, uh, I, when I woke up, my daughters were right there at my bedside and they were crying. So that hit me like a ton of bricks. I knew at that moment I had to make changes. And then when I, when I was able to get into this cardiac rehab, um, uh, these changes were a little easier, even though they were pretty drastic, they were easier because I felt I was too young. I felt I was broken. Hmm. Like I'm, I'm broken. I, I have heart disease at 46, all my peers, even the peers that I thought I was in better shape than them, they're not having heart attacks. Right. And I thought, Ooh, heart attack by definition is when an artery gets blocked and that, part of the heart, the muscle isn't getting oxygen. So it dies. So I'm thinking I'm literally broken. Hmm. Like I will, but I still thought, okay, I still have to be there for my daughters. Um, and, and, and I'll, I'll find a way to just get through life. At least I'm alive. So I, uh, it was pretty drastic with the, uh, the diet, you know, whole food plant-based as opposed to meat. But like I said, I I was scared to death, you know, not being there for my daughter. So I adapted the exercise. I decided it's going to be on no more off and on uh, the stress management part. I absolutely loved the yoga and meditation. Like I said, I started my own practice called yoga five O Um, I think that's a game changer. This whole lifestyle is a game changer, but I think one of the biggest aspects triggered my heart attack was stress and not dealing with it in the best way. Hmm. I was always high anxiety. And like I said earlier, I never wanted my problem to be someone else's. So I never talked to anybody. I went through a high conflict divorce and people around me saw me suffering, my family and close friends, but I didn't talk about it because I just don't want, I didn't want to put that burden on other people. So I kept everything in and, um, that was not good, right? (laughs) Not good at all. And so with all the changes, they were drastic, but I knew it had to be drastic to avoid going through that again. Hmm. And so I, like I said, I think I'm in better shape. I I, I was never a runner. Like I I played baseball and wrestled in in my teenage years and you have to run just for practice and and that sort of thing. But I was never a runner. And then once I got through cardiac rehab and I was able to exercise a little more intensely, I started to run. And then I started to enter 5Ks and then I started to enter 10Ks and then I started to enter half marathons. Hmm. And that's just where I'm at now. I'm not, I I don't know about a marathon, but. um, Neither do I. Don't worry. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. That's, uh, I don't know. I'm kind of torn between like whether I could even do it or whether it would be even good for my heart. But a half marathon is fine. I've done a few of those. I've done, my times have been pretty decent. Um, I'm not doing it just to check off a box i'm doing it because it's the journey really it's not really the race it's the lead up to the race and it's keeping me consistent with with running and then um working out with doing uh weight resistance exercise body resistance and and kettlebells and weights that's important especially the older you get so all of this i think the timing was perfect because if i would have continued with my life I probably would have went into, I don't want to say I'm in old age now, but <laughs> I probably would have continued with those same habits and then started coming into old age with bad habits and bad lifestyle. So I'm sort of thankful that this happened when it did because it totally changed the way I'm living my life. 
And I think I will go into those my later years um, <laughs> way healthier than I would have otherwise. Yeah. What, do you think that if you didn't have the heart attack, was there any amount or any level of um, nagging or pleading or conversation that you could have had with your daughters that would have led to this sort of change or did it or would that have all just fallen on deaf ears and it's not I'm not that bad I'm not the worst shape in the department I'm relatively healthy I'm still young blah 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 and you kind of brush it off was there any level of intervention from them that could have made this difference or did it, did it do you think it honestly would have taken you having that heart attack I, I think for me because I'm hard-headed that it took because my dad had um he had heart disease he had two heart attacks in his 60s hmm prior to me having one in my forties. So I knew, okay, so I know I saw him have two heart attacks and survive. Well, I also know that, um, since he had heart attacks and he's my dad, my biological dad, that, that just increased my odds of having heart disease. Right. And that still didn't make big changes in my life. Like I would do it a little bit like, Ooh, I better start exercising, but then poof, something would come and interrupt it. And then I wouldn't right. exercise for weeks and same thing with eating. Um, so I don't think anything would have made a difference, but I've seen people like the people I've been around, like through cardiac rehab and, and through just me talking about lifestyle medicine and being around this population, I've seen a lot of people who have gone through heart attacks and then um, because modern medicine's great, they'll come in and and take out the blockage and, you know, prescribe you some medicines. And then you feel great. Like, oh, nothing ever happened. Right. So I've seen people that are like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Go back to life, eating poorly and being sedentary and and not making changes. So um, it's tough. Change is tough. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I've seen the extreme example of that where guys will be like, I, I need to work out even less now because now my arteries are brand new. <laughs> right. Like now I got them. I got rotor rooted. I'm clean. Like I was cleaner than I was in my 20s. So I'm good. Like I can coast now for another 40 years till this happens again. By that time I'm 80, you're, who cares? So yeah, I've, I've definitely seen the far reaching, uh, ironic statements and the uh, abrasive statements of that. Um, so let's do, so let's say this then if you, I mean, what, so I, I want to kind of play you against yourself then like as, as back then, if you, if you could see yourself then now going through it, or if you see some, one of your friends going through it now, do you, do you, do you try to convince them to make changes or do you just tell them your story and hope that maybe it rings true? Cause you know how stubborn you were. And I'm sure maybe yeah. someone at some point was like, Hey man, you got to make some changes. And you're like, yeah, I'm good. But even with, you know, you wouldn't listen to anybody done anyway. So what do you do now with people that you identify as maybe, could benefit from it, but you don't want to, you don't want to waste your time or be too pushy. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's a fantastic question. And I really felt that when, um, I was at this conference cause there was a hundred, a hundred and something, uh, police officers at this, this Marshall's conference. And so I tell my story and, um, I was telling my friend that I went there with, I'm like, I wonder how many of them are just going to roll their eyes and just say, yeah, <laughs> or, that's the jam. or they may say, well, some of them came up to me later. Oh, great story. I love what you said. That's cool. I, I love that. You know, but, but, but um, I, I, I don't. And then with my friends, I, I, I don't preach. They know my story. I'll tell them my story. They have questions still all the time. Like, are you doing this or how often do you do that? They're always asking questions. So, I'll answer their questions. I tell them my story. I tell them the information I know from um, all the, the 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 books I've read or the studies I've read. I'll just mention that stuff, but I don't push them because I know how people are, and um, we all take our own paths, and we all have our own journey, and it takes different amounts to make – like with my family – um, I have a brother and two sisters. Now they have a dad and, and, and our dad died of a heart attack at his third heart attack hmm. at, at 74. So he had two heart attacks in his sixties and then his third heart attack at 74. So he went from one day, he's perfectly fine. Cause he was in pretty decent shape, like walking and, and having a good time. And then boom, he drops dead of a heart attack. Oh. So 
so we looked at that as like, wow, it's early. We didn't see him like declining and not right. being able to, he just went from, yeah, he that's, there's dad. And then boom, he's gone. So my siblings see that dad clearly had heart disease and died of a heart attack. Their brother had a heart attack. You know, our grandpa had heart disease. We know of great uncles and uncles who have had heart disease. So I, I, even as stubborn as I was, I look at them and I'm like, wow, this picture wasn't that clear for me, but <laughs> it, it's clear for them. Yeah. And I still don't preach to them. Um, I try to just, you know, be maybe possibly a role model. Uh, you know, my family, along with my friends, they're like, mm, that's too, uh, that's too drastic what you're doing. Sure. And I'm like, you know what's drastic is when they stick a a, 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 a a wire or a tube up your up your thigh and goes into your heart right. <laughs> clear out a, a blockage. That's drastic. Yeah. That's that's serious. So doing some exercise, eating healthy, yoga, meditation, that's that's easy. Do you, but, feel, do you feel like it almost gave your family a false sense of security of like, well, everybody's having these heart attacks. It's going to happen, but everybody seems pretty okay on the other side of it. So as long as I can just get through it, I'll probably be fine, you know, like dad was for a while or like Carl is now. And yeah, it'll suck, but we got medicine. So, um, you know, I'll just deal with that when it gets here. I, I think I think you're exactly right because um, I think my siblings fall under the same umbrella as a lot of society does nowadays. They, they see how great and you know, how advanced our um, – medical you know medicines and devices and surgeries are that they're like hey if i have a heart attack you know they'll clean me out give me some medicine then maybe i'll start to make some changes but i'll I'll get another shot at life you know i've seen carl do it i've seen our dad do it a couple times i've seen the neighbor do it i've seen so-and-so do it but that first heart attack could be your last you know you just never know yeah um Man, those those are tough lessons to learn, man. But I I believe you in your strategy. And for one simple reason is that you didn't start off. The first thing you said to me was not that you're plant-based and vegetarian. You start, if you were a nut job, that would have been the first thing you said was like, Hey, I'm a vegetarian. Now listen to this other junk. I have to say, you start off with all these other things. And we eventually got to the fact that you eat plants. So I appreciate your, your approach in all aspects. And, uh, it really sounds like you got a handle on this thing now. So congratulations on that. And um, Thank you. you know, I think that, I think that you're, uh, you're doing a good job, man. It seems like I looked through your Instagram and, and you got a good thing going. I'm really excited to hear this presentation you have in May. Um, so where do you, I know you said, um, marathons might be a stretch, right? Uh, but where do you go from here? Like you're retired from the police force now. Um, so you're once again, not a likable part of society and, and you're probably much more level headed now with your meditation and yoga practice. Um, oh yeah. So is that your is that your next career? Are you going to go start doing yoga for cops, or where do you see yourself going now? I would love to. I would I would love to be able to teach yoga to um, all first responders. And um, I don't know. I'm going to see where this goes. I'm also looking at some avenues of teaching, getting into um, public education. Um, but I, I want to try something a little different than, uh, even though I still love law enforcement and I love first responders and I want to be able to help, uh, all first responders. Um, I, I kind of, uh, I like, I like to try different things. So I feel like I'm young and energized enough to where, hell, I'll just try another career. Right. Maybe I'll try teaching young people, um, some. But one, one thing about when you mentioned, you know, hey, you didn't mention plants at first, um, all of these pillars, and, and you're probably very aware of this, all of these pillars, whether there's four, six, or seven, whatever, they all feed off of each other. So it's not like, oh, I do two of them well, but I, I, I suck at the others. Well, you can always improve those others. Right. Or maybe, oh, I'm good at these two, but these, eh, forget that. I don't like exercises. So I, I eat, I just eat well and meditate or whatever you need all, all of them to get, they feed off each other. Right. So if you're not getting good sleep, you're probably not going to be wanting to exercise and vice versa. If you do exercise and get in some good movement, 
you're probably going to be wore out enough by the end of the day to want to sleep well. Right. And if you're not eating well, you might not be able to exercise very well. You might not feel well. Um, so, or if you're really indulging in, 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 um, in those toxic substances, you know, whether it's alcohol or smoking, that's going to do a lot to affect you. And if you have poor relationships and you're isolated, that may affect you with your eating or exercise or, or stress management. So they, they all feed off of each other. So it's, 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 it's a combination of everything together to, to really have the best outcomes. Yeah. One of the ways we liken it a lot is, is like sitting in a chair. And uh, since we use four pillars for the spring for change thing, um, it's just easy to visualize. Like you're sitting in a chair, it has four legs, right? And if yeah. one of them is short by an inch, meaning you don't get enough sleep the night before um, to stay level on that chair, maybe you lean really hard on your nutrition. Like you're leaning towards the opposite corner away from that thing. And that you can do that for a while, but after a while it becomes uncomfortable, you know? Um, yeah. And then if two legs are shortened, let's say your sleep and nutrition is, is poor, um, you know, the two remaining ones, you're going to have to, like levitate basically you you perform this impossible task tip over way far to one side to keep yourself level and that's just not sustainable so yeah keeping keeping a good match on all those things and keeping everything as baseline and like you're saying it doesn't have to be extraordinary in one right but just keep all them baseline pay attention to them and make sure they're all functioning and then you can build slowly you know one thing up here one thing up there but i think where people get really kind of screwed up is like you're saying they'll they'll be like you know what i'm not um, I'm not working out. My sleep is tar terrible. I have bad relationships. I drink a lot. Um, but I'm just going to eat vegetables and that's going to become my personality. And now I'm healthy. You know, it, that doesn't work like that. Like you're, you're on a, you're on a unicycle at that point. Um, so, so yeah, I completely agree. If you were going to, if you were going to give people advice, cause this, like it, I kind of mentioned before, before we started recording, we're on the spring for change month. Uh, in April, and we're, we're addressing the four pillars, the fitness, nutrition, sleep, and mindfulness. Where would you start? Like, which one of your six or my four, because they're, they're shared, which one of those would you start with in kind of a small dose increment that you think is like the low-hanging fruit or the easiest one to start chipping away at to build momentum to the other ones? Wow, that's that's a good question, and I don't, I don't think I've ever had that question. Um, I, you know, there's you know, when it comes to like exercise, you know, there's always information out there that's like, oh, the best exercise you can do is swimming right. or the best exercise you can do is, is running or kettlebells or CrossFit. Well, actually the best exercise you could do is the one you will do. The right. one you, so that's the best exercise. So I guess because you got to move, that's so important. So I would, it's about little habits. So if somebody's, uh, you know, worried about like, oh, my God, I haven't exercised in months, you know, and then doing that first time is so difficult and you don't want to overdo it. I would just recommend like um, like it, if you just have to do do one push up right. a day, you know, or, or, or make that your goal. You know, and, and it depends on who you are. Some will, you know, you could start out with one push up, but maybe somebody's like, no, my goal needs to be 10, you know, to start with. That's right. fine. But it's something you can do. And so let's just say it's one. So you do that one push up. Mm, there's a good chance you might do two or three. And then the next day, just, hey, my goal has been one. So and, and even to reach that, um, you know, there's information out there that says, hey, have your workout gear laid out the night before so it's easily accessible in the morning. You know, maybe it's your running shoes. Maybe it's your shorts or whatever, just to make things easier to do that one thing and that's for exercise and that's for food maybe if you're not really you know you're not getting a lot of vegetables or fruit just add something you know to your meal um get a side salad along with you know if you're ordering a hamburger and whatever and fries um maybe substitute the fries for something else but if you don't want to substitute the fries at first just add you know, maybe a little side salad too. Cause I know change is so difficult and you don't want to turn people off from eating right or, you know, getting exercise or any of this. Um, so start out small baby steps, but stay consistent. 
eating a side, side salad once a day for five days is a hell of a lot better than eating a whole salad without the hamburger one day. <laughs> but say, oh, this is horrible. Right. Go oh, four days with just the hamburger. So, so little, little increments. And then as far as the like, well, let's, stress- let's pause there for one second. Cause I, I don't want to, I don't want to forget this point because you just brought something to mind for me is a lot of times when we talk about adding in vegetables or adding in fruits or a salad, I always think about it as at home. I always think about it as buy the box of salad and add that into your meal that you're making, right? And I've never yeah. thought about it as going out. And I think that's probably a way more effective measure because at that point, you've, you're paying for it that night you're fit with money. Like you're saying, I'm going to spend an extra $7 and put a salad on this meal. And there's much higher of a chance of you eating that salad because you're paying for it immediately compared to... I'm going to buy this okay. box of salad for three fifty, and it's going to be there all for the next two weeks. And now, now a week and a half from now, you go in your fridge and you're like, ah, that money's spent a week and a half ago. I can just throw this stuff out, you know? So that's a great one because I, I always think about that stuff in terms of being in your own home and preparing your meals. But man, if you want to guarantee you're going to eat your salad, add it to your meal that you're paying for 20 minutes from now. And I, you're not going to want to leave that on the plate and just waste money in the, in the acute sense. Right. And they'll probably um, dress it up and give you some ideas on how you can make your salad at home a little better like sure. <laughs> or adding, you know, chopped carrots or whatever. Cause yeah, a, a, a chef or, or a, a cook at the restaurant, you know, they usually could dress it up a little better than you can. Yeah. And then the, the stress management part, like I said before, if you're getting in your exercise and your nutrition, then in, in your sleep, that should help with stress. But if, you know, if you're, toward the yoga and meditation especially if you're a first responder i would just say hey you know have an open mind because a lot of people will dismiss mindfulness meditation yoga and say you know that's that's you know woo woo that's hippy dippy that's uh that's not for me but have an open mind you know and and give it a shot and again i would say baby steps with that too yeah yeah there's definitely a, a learning curve to that and that's so this week on Spring for Change is Fitness Week, and next week is going to be Mindfulness Week. And then my entire goal for Mindfulness Week is to take a lot of the fear away from it by just explaining exactly how, first of all, enormous of a term and um, field it is. Like It can mean so many different things to so many people, so it doesn't have to be eyes closed in a dark room for 30 minutes meditating, right? It can be literally 30 seconds of just paying attention to something. Um, yeah. in a very informal sense. So my whole focus for that week, for next week, um, I'm not sure exactly when this is going to come out, so put that in the context of when you listen to it, but is going to be to, to take mindfulness and stress relief and make it doable and not so mystical, for lack of a better term. You know, Make it a, a normal thing that we all probably do already anyways, but we just don't recognize it as being a mindfulness practice or dedicated meditation or anything like that, but kind of make it consumable by the average dope like me. That, that's so awesome. That's, that's the first step because people aren't aware. So for you to, to introduce it that way is fantastic. We'll see how it goes. It's a good idea. We'll see how it goes. I might get yeah. scared halfway through it and be like, that's too much. I can't, I'm going to call somebody. Um, and it, that's kind of why, like the, the, the name of my presentation, I didn't have a name for it until, they, they're like, uh, what's the name? I'm like, uh, finding awareness. Mm. Because I think that's like, that's what happened with me. Like I wasn't aware. I didn't have the knowledge. Maybe I did, but I didn't pay attention. I wasn't truly aware of what my bad habits were doing to me. Mm. And I wasn't truly aware of how just some lifestyle changes would make all the difference in the world. So it's just, I just called it finding awareness and actually my introductory yoga session for first responders is just called awareness. And it's all about awareness, about being aware of who you are and, you know, where you are in space and um, where you are in your journey in life or whatever and where you are with your health. So it's about awareness. I dig it, man. That's, that's something that um, I struggle with on the larger global sense and also the much more micro sense, like all the way from, Hey, when you're in a fire 
uh, pay attention to the way you're breathing. Like you're really ripping through this bottle right now. Start paying attention to that. Be aware of what you're doing all the way up to like trying to be a parent and like, Hey, are you frowning right now at your child without thinking about it? Or are you yelling and you don't, you just think you're talking? Um, man, what a struggle, what an absolute struggle. So I'm glad that you're approaching that with a, a pretty measured approach. Um, and some, some great kind of lessons through it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. What you were just talking about. Like, are you frowning when you're talking to your child? Like, but the, the fact that like, if, if you could bring that to your awareness, the more you can bring that to your awareness, the less chance you'll be doing that. Well, I can tell you that if the kids don't notice it, my wife and I notice it on each other. We'll be like, yeah. what do you look so pissed about? I'm like, I'm not. She's like, why are you snapping at me? I'm like, I'm not snapping at you. It's like, it's like you know, it's, if the kids aren't the mirror, then our, my spouse is. And so it's uh, immediately available feedback for me most of the time. Yeah. And that's important awareness, you know, knowing. And then, uh, then you could do something about it and yeah. make change. Yeah. Well, this is awesome, man. I'm, I'm so glad you reached out and, uh, and wanted to come on and were um, uh, accommodating to my many schedule changes and time zone mess ups. And I appreciate that. And um, I'm looking forward to meet you, meeting you in, in no, uh, May. I almost said November. Jeez, because it's snowing, because it's snowing outside. Um, <laughs> to meet you in May and uh, wrapping a little bit more, man. I'm excited to see your, are you, what day are you presenting on? The 15th or the 16th? Uh, the first day, the first, I think I'm the first speaker. So oh, awesome. Are you sticking around for the 16th or are you, are you taking off? Are you coming oh, back? No, I, it's, I, I, I live so close. So yeah. I'm going, uh, yeah, I'm going to be there the whole day, all both days. Okay. I'm, I'm coming in, I'm working the 15th. So I'm going to leave right after shift on the 16th and get out there as early as I can. Um, and then I think I'm the first one or something like that in the afternoon of the second day. So I'll try to get there early so we can wrap a little bit and, uh, and, uh, hang out. Yeah, that's all. Hey, real quick on a side note, I uh, I was an arson investigator for a few years, so nice. so I was so my office was at Central Fire. Okay, man, and, you got to see the heroes at work, huh? I, I, hey, I'm telling you, man, <laughs> I was pretty, uh, I was pretty um, ambivalent about firefighters. Yeah. I mean, I knew so many jokes, you know, with police officers and and firefighters, but I just as a young officer, I'm like, I'm just doing my job. Uh huh. Funny, funny. But, um, but once I did arson, I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, these guys, like you guys go from zero to 100, you know, when those tones go off yeah. and you're sleeping, if you're sleeping, you know, if it's that, you know, which of course it happens all the time when you're sleeping, but, um, you, that is the point that is, you guys, I mean, Trying to get a, a trying to get a hold of your health and everything is so important for firefighters because going from zero to a hundred is not a good thing for your health. Yeah. So it, funny, funny you should mention that. I started wearing a heart rate monitor just in the past week or so at work, um, testing yeah. one out for a company. And um, so what I've noticed is there's so I'll give the scenario: sleeping, and an alarm came in at four o'clock in the morning to an old hospital that we have in town that's been refurbished into a medical center, but it's been now abandoned for a couple of years. So our response to that isn't just one engine. It's, it's the full complement as if a house was on fire. So a lot of people going, um, and it was at four fifteen in the morning. So I look back at the, the, um, record from, or the data from the heart rate monitor. And I was resting heart rate when I was sleeping around 50, like just between 50, 55, yeah. Within two minutes, it was at 118 because the alarm wow. came in, uh, it jumps up to about 100. You can see a little um, cliff in there. Then it goes up to 118, and then it dips down to about 100 while we're en route. So we're driving for four or five minutes, and then you get on scene, and we had to go investigate. So you get out with your air pack on and grab your tools and go. It goes back up to 120, and then we were climbing from the basement to the, thir the third floor of this abandoned hospital four or five times, kind of looking for problems and checking stuff and double-checking stuff. Um, so yeah, in the acute sense, now that was the extreme because it was a resting heart rate. It went from 50 to 118 within two minutes. Um, during the day, we had a fire, uh, an oven fire, and it went. It was around 80 because we were out doing stuff. And same thing, jumped up to about 110, 115, dipped while we were en route, and then back up to 120-ish when we got on scene and had to go into the house and investigate uh, the oven fire. So on average, you know, you're looking at a, a 30 to 40 to 60 beat jump within 90 seconds. Um, and probably much shorter than that if you broke down and I looked at like the detail graph, but 
Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I was, so I showed it to one of my friends I work with and I said this, the terrible thing for me is that I don't really feel it. Like, I don't feel my heart beating out of my chest as if you were running or working out and you're feeling like, oh, yeah. my heart's at 120 right now. I don't know if there's just so much going on. And what I think, what I really think it is, is that I'm accustomed to it. So if I was riding at this department, if I wasn't a fireman, if I was a banker and I went to the fire department and alarm came in and my heart rate jumped, I would probably be like, holy crap, my heart's racing right now. But, <laughs> but 20 years oh. in, 15, uh, 19 years in, so 15 in my full-time department, I think I'm just used to that feeling so it doesn't stick out in my mind as something abnormal, which is absolutely terrifying to me because that means that, yeah, I tracked it this past week of it happening three times over the course of two shifts, but for 15 years before that, it was also happening and I had no idea it was happening. So it was really, one of the guys I showed it to described it as absolutely depressing. Um, I described it as kind of scary. Um, scary. I'm gonna yeah, I'm going to try to get this heart rate monitor a few other people just so it does. it's just not my data because... I could certainly yeah. be an outlier of nervousness uh, without a doubt, but uh, right. I want to get on a few different people and see how they do and kind of compare what the average heart rate jump is when the tones come in for an event, you know, and, and then compared to just like a routine ambulance call, what happens when that comes in? Um, yeah. So yeah, you're right. It's something that uh, until recently when I really started looking at it, you know, I thought like, yeah, we get going and get moving. No big deal. And then I saw the data. I was like, holy crap, my, <laughs> this, is, this isn't great. Yeah, that yeah, that's 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 something that w was a little different than as a police officer. I mean, we we were like active, and then something you know, you know, maybe a, a hot call, and and we go up. Um, I never, I should have. That would have been great if I would have wore a heart rate monitor. I'm sure that's something more departments will probably be doing. Probably there'll be uh, groups out there that want to improve the health outcomes of police and fire. So they'll be doing that. But my problem came though, I find out now after talking to doctors and things that um, I had a problem with uh, bringing my heart rate down. Mm, yeah. But when it got elevated, whether it was at work or at home, I, I couldn't bring it down. Mm. It, so it sustained for too long and uh, now with breathing techniques and meditation and yoga, it's like I can kick in my parasympathetic nervous system at will, and uh, and, and and bring bring myself down. Yeah, so that's great, like, like a magic calm button, right? <laughs> a magical reset button. Yeah, um, yeah. So to to close this out, do you have anything you want to leave? Any small, uh, bite sized bits of advice for anybody before we kind of wrap this thing up? Move more. Eat better, stress less, stress less. Yeah. L love and connect, and laugh often. Hmm. I mean, that's so, it. That, yeah, pick one of those. <laughs> well, and you you gotta laugh. You gotta laugh at life, especially when you're in first as a first responder. Yeah. We do a lot of serious and grim things, so we do need to laugh. And I think anybody, you know, you hear the old adage, "Laughter is the best medicine." It truly is great medicine. Hmm. Um, don't know if it's the best medicine, but it's yeah. great medicine. So I, I always include laugh often as, as part of lifestyle, lifestyle medicine. Yeah, laughter is a good medicine, but statins are pretty dope too. So we got to pay attention, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> put that on a shirt. Absolutely. Um, we're going to keep talking after I stop recording because you talked about the, the humor and um, my, your admiration for the heroes that are fire department. I'm debating right now how many um, abrasive fire versus police jokes I want to put into my presentation. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit after we stop this because I got a couple of ideas. Some of them will not fly. They will not be acceptable. Um, but yeah. I got a few that I want to put in there. So I'll, I'll use you as a sounding board for a couple of those. But uh, Carl, thank you, man. Thanks for hanging out and getting this together. And uh, I'm telling you, I'm pumped. What, where can everybody find you if they want to look you up and uh, look up your yoga stuff or just your contact information? Um, yoga 5 So it's yoga, Y-O-G-A, F I V E dash O dot, dot com. And then um, I'm on LinkedIn, Carl Karch, and I'm on Instagram, Carl Karch, and that's where the most information about me will be. Awesome, man. Awesome. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing you. This will be good. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs>